Welcome to Bigfoot and the Bunny. This is a couple's journey into the mysterious, the unknown, and, and the, the paranormal. paranormal. I'm your host, Chris Carr. And I'm your host, Kristen Johnson. Together, Together we, we are, are Bigfoot, Bigfoot and, and the, the Bunny. Bunny. Hey there, listeners of the Paranormal UK Radio Network. This is Chris Carr. I'm the host of Bigfoot and a Bunny, along with Kristen Johnson. In this episode, we are going to talk to Dan Baldwin and George Sewell uh, about their new book, Paranormal Pendulum 3, The Abduction of Lindsay Higgins, The UFO Phenomenon, the spirit world and beyond a fascinating book i think you're going to love this Lindsay higgins was the subject of the netflix series haunted uh, she is featured in uh, season one episode five if you want to look that up we talk about that as well dan is a professional writer and often a ghost writer for other professionals he has written and co-written and ghosted more than 50 books and has won numerous uh, local, regional, and national awards. He is a certified clinical hypnotherapist and plays the Native American flute, uh, along with being an expert pendulum dowser. Uh, having used the pendulum to assist in finding missing persons for over 15 years, which is really fascinating. Uh, George uh, Sewell is, describes himself as a cognitive philanthropist. Try saying that five times fast. Active in all aspects of theater, his undergraduate degree is in speech and journalism from the Northwestern State University in Louisiana, as well as a Master of Arts degree in drama and communication from the University of New Orleans. As a playwright, he has written plays for community theater, college theater, and dinner theater. He was awarded the Louisiana Division of Arts Fellowship in Theater for Playwriting. These guys are super interesting, and I think you're going to enjoy this. So sit back, relax, and let's get this mother rolling. Hey, George. Welcome. Dan. Hello. Hello. Howdy. How are you doing today? Uh, again, well, thank you for your patience with us. We had a little talk out there about the times and some miscommunication. So, thank you again. Um, we're we're live. We're on uh, a haunted series. Looks amazing. How did you guys get involved in all this? A phone call out of the blue one night. We <laughs> get and then it all began. What? Well, that's exactly how it happened. Just. Uh, you know, and when was it? Uh, September 2017. Uh, one night the house phone rang, and normally I don't answer it because usually it's a junk call, but for some reason, some reason, and I think I'll take this. So I answered and said, well, Hello. And the voice said, uh, Is this George Sewell? And I said, Yes. Well, this is Lindsay Higgin. And Joe Beth Baggett said, I could talk to you. And I recognized uh, Joe Beth. Uh, she's deceased now, but she was a mutual acquaintance of my, myself. And she also was acquainted with Lindsay, who I had absolutely no knowledge of. I did not know anything about Lindsay. But at that point, she began talking about, no, we had a good two-hour conversation where she pretty much related to me her life, beginning at around the age of two, two and a half, three, with a very remarkable uh, witnessed event that occurred uh, at that age that she remembers, by the way, and a number of paranormal experiences, including what appeared to be uh, several abduction, I don't like that word, but uh, several abductions by non-human uh, beings, if you will. And essentially at the end of our conversation, uh, because uh, in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, um, I was the assistant state director of Louisiana for the Mutual UFO Network. So I had an opportunity to speak to a, a number of people who had had various encounters or sightings or other experiences and had learned a great deal from them. Uh, and I was able to tell Lindsay that pretty much everything that you told me tonight, Lindsay, I've heard from other people. And that was a great relief for her just to hear that. My bet. So that's how it began. Now, what Lindsay was doing, uh, kind of before she made the phone call, um, she had come to a conclusion that she was not going to sit on this any longer. I mean, she'd been sitting on all of these experiences pretty much all her life. There was nobody to go to family that that was not an option. Um, there just wasn't other than maybe one or two friends to a certain level. She could not talk about her experiences and she just reached a decision. I got to get, get this out. And she listened to a podcast, learned information about a Los Angeles production company that was looking for 
genuine stories of people who had paranormal experiences all their lives for a possible series of in Netflix. And she just decided, well, that's the way I'm going to do it. So she wrote up her story, sent it off to the production company. And within 14 hours, uh, the production company's back with her to set up a formal Skype interview with the production team. And at the end of that interview, they said, OK, you're on. And then wow. they asked her wow. if she knew of anybody else in the Shreveport, Louisiana area who either had similar experiences or knew about uh, this particular subject. And that's when she called Joe Beth and Joe Beth said, well, you need to call George. And so she called George. And that's kind of how I got involved with the uh, production company. Wow, uh, that's amazing. And it happened really quick. this whole thing is Dan's going to talk about later. It's just amazing how this whole process just went click, 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 click. It was um, it was an exciting ride. <laughs> it wow. sounds I, like it. Her story must have been uh, incredibly compelling yeah. for them to get yes. back so fast. I mean, yeah, yes. a huge streaming company. Mm -hmm. They really have the their pick and choose of things, I would imagine. Yeah. In fact, uh, the, the first time I met Lindsay in person uh, was on location uh, outside of Pasadena, California for the shoot itself. So that's the first time we actually met in person. And uh, yeah. She tells a good story, and she, it's, she, she's a she's the real thing. She's the real deal. She's the real deal. I love that. Dan, how did you come to be involved with this? Well, uh, um, yeah, I was writing. A, I wrote a book called uh, uh, Paranormal Pendulum One, which is dowsing the deceased. It's a how-to book on how to use pendulum dowsing to contact uh, you know the spirit world. And George was uh, really a a massive research, I don't say a system, but a research partner in developing that book. And out of that, I, I came together and had a uh, enough material for a second book, Paranormal Pendulum 2, What the Spirits Say, which is all about what, what the spirits told us in developing that first book. You know, what it's like on the other side, you, you know, is, is mom and dad over there? Is, is Fluffy over there? Is there a white light? What's reincarnation? And all that. In developing that book, uh, George introduced me to Lindsay Higgins, and we investigated at that point uh, her re the, the reincarnation angle of her story, and that's about a third of, of the of the book too, which led to you know, me and George uh, working with Lindsay about her UFO experiences. So it, it's been a long process. It sounds like it. Yes, it's like one thing after another. Yeah, and in, in particular, uh, I was really intrigued with Dan's uh, ability to use the pendulum dowsing as a technique to explore uh, these realms that otherwise it would be very, very difficult to investigate. And so it was just kind of a natural thought. Let's use a pendulum to investigate and see if we can learn what the heck is going on in, with Lindsay Higgins. And that's kind of what sparked it. Wow. Excellent. Let's talk a little bit about yeah. that. And pendulum dowsing and these dowsing rods and similar tools with the hand that physically involved. I, it's my perception and our perception may be you can help us along there it's like get a, a way to get into your subconscious and like the subconscious seems to know everything that's going on around us do you feel it is that or do you feel like you're connecting to a spirit when you douse tell us a little bit about dowsing. Okay, yeah yeah the subconscious is key uh, when you uh pendulum is nothing more than it, it's a rock on a string it's, it's just a tool uh there's no magic in it whatsoever Okay, it, it, it like I said, it's just a tool. When the thing moves, your fingers, the, the muscles in your fingers are actually causing it to move. But mm -hmm. the key is, those those muscles are reacting on instructions from your subconscious, and your subconscious is uh, able to contact uh, spirits of the departed, uh, ETs, as George and I found out, uh, for lack of a better term, the uh, the Akashic records or the information that is out there. Right. To right. Tap into that. I suppose uh, let, me, let me point out something. Yeah, let me point out something real quick here that that's really important in the uh, area of paranormal work. In that, uh, if normally when you're out uh, and you run into this problem too, I'm sure you're you're investigating an area and you're hoping for just something, you know, bump on the wall, somebody tugging at your ear, uh, an EVP, a word, then you know that's a successful mission. With pendulum dowsing, you can conduct ongoing conversations for extended periods of time. George and I have conducted it, you know, conversations with spirits up to 20 minutes. Wow. Excellent. Yeah, as long as the spirit is willing, the spirit is willing, as long as the spirit is willing to talk, you can continue the conversation. And, and I literally mean the conversation. It's a back and forth question and answer, yes or no, 
for uh, as long as they're willing to talk. I think uh, with an experienced dowser, as somebody who knows how to keep their hand really, really still, yeah. you know, yeah. I've done some, you know, dow uh, used pendulum before, and I'm pretty familiar with like how still you need to keep your hand to store, sort of start to get a, a, a re reply that maybe you're subconscious and not just the handshaking. I've also seen people who you could physically see their hand moving. So, which is kind of ridiculous. In the paranormal world, people on investigations, to get that kind of yes-no conversation, they might use something like a K2 or EMF meter or something like that, mm -hmm. which may is not that reliable, right? Because you don't know if spirit is going to interact with it or whether it's a projection from ourselves mm -hmm. manipulating that electronic tool where you have a more direct line holding the pendulum, no? Yeah, well, with the pendulum, I mean, you you know what's going on while it's going on. I mean, if you wanted to fake it, I mean, you can make it go any direction you want to make it go any time. You know, the the key to successful dowsing is to keep your mind uh, blank, so to speak, so that the uh, subconscious can actually do the work. Uh, but you know, if you want to fake it, you can. But what 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 does oh, that? Yeah. Yeah, what does that get you? Nothing. Yeah, right. Right. Nothing, of exactly. course. And I didn't mean that the people were intentionally faking it. Just oh, no, they, no. But you know, yeah. my, point, my point is you get a yes, you're going to get a yes or a no. You know, there's no area where you need to try to interpret it. Mm -hmm. And, and when what, you do that, are you pretty much going, like if it's going from left to right in front of you, that's a no, like you're shaking your head yeah, and up yeah, and yeah, down? Yeah, yes. for me, a, a circle to the right is a yes. A circle to the left is a no. If it goes back and forth, uh, either I, I need to rephrase the question or maybe the spirit just doesn't want to answer, which, which happens. You know, a lot of times you get, I won't tell you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you <know? laughs> no, when, when that happens, does it kind of give you both? Both go both ways so you don't, you're unsure of the answer? Counterclockwise? No, you get, you get a definite yes or no or, you know, rephrase the question or I'm not going to answer. You, you, you're, you're pretty clear on what's going on. That's fantastic. That's yeah. wonderful. Love that. I love that. So you, you guys got into this. You start working with Lindsay and, and looking at her story and the, the sort of thing. And I know I don't want to give away the series, but for those of us who haven't haven't seen it, can you give us a brief outline? And I'm not sure. Do, is there any legal uh, restrictions in playing, say, the, the trailer on that? I'm not aware that there is a trailer. I'm not aware of any restrictions uh, one way or the other. It's uh, Again, it's Netflix Haunted Season 1, Episode 5. That's that's Lindsay's uh, segment. It's about a 20, 25-minute episode. And it's about half of Lindsay telling her life story to her cousin, who she's known all her life, and to one of her best friends, who's known her all her life. And I'm also sitting in on that discussion. And the other half are the Netflix production company recreations of some of the key moments in Lindsay's story, uh, starting when she was a, a child with severe abdominal pains and going through her teenage years uh, with possible uh, physical uh, abductions or activities going on. Okay. And a big money shot when she was in college where um, she is literally taken from her room in a beam of light through the wall into a craft and off to parts unknown. So there's wow. a lot of recreations in there that give a sense of what her experience was like. And, and for her in particular, and we'll, we'll talk about some other things as well, but for her in particular, as this kind of relates, she had childhood experiences. Uh, one of the things that we have noticed on our show, and we've been fortunate enough to talk to hundreds of people yes. over the years, uh, you know, about, different phenomena um people that were just interested in uh, whether it be the occult or uh, paranormal phenomena or ufology um the thing that rings true of maybe 99 percent of them something like that is they had some sort of childhood experience a which is a fascinating a statistic yeah you know we mention this a lot because it, there just seems to be something to that why that it's almost like their brain is trying to complete the sentence, you know, like what really happened to me mm -hmm. when I was a kid and there's some interest or fascination later in life. They're not necessarily shaken by it. Kristen and I are good examples of this. Yes. Um, I was drawn to these things due to childhood experiences that I had. Kristen was repelled from them for a long time, Very long time a long time to get her interested in, into it because she was literally shook from a negative death. experiences. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Mine weren't positive, but there was just something in my brain, I think, that just wanted me to. He ran with it. To know. What was that <laughs> yeah, real? Yeah. What did I experience? Will I see that again? Yeah, what happened well, when we die? One, one thing that we, we came up with that after the two years of looking into it is that uh, what was occurring with Lindy, Lindsay was nothing that was random. This was part of a, a long-term process that she agreed to participate in. Uh, we found out more about that at, at one point, but uh, it was all connected. Okay, it was not just a random in the night, you know, snatch and grab or something like that. It, that there was no, no, that's not it, not at all what was going on with Lindsay. And I want to spend a little bit of time on the on the the event that occurred. This is a memory for her. It's a memory when she was roughly two and a half, three years old. Her family's a, a well-known restaurant family in the Shreveport, Louisiana area. And back in the late 1970s, her father, who's a big railroad guy, he loves trains. Uh, he had an opportunity to acquire a central station railroad station, and he turned it into a really nice restaurant. And the family lived upstairs, and of course the restaurant was downstairs. And when the restaurant was open of course her parents are downstairs uh running the restaurant and lindsay's in her room on the second floor uh pretty much just having to amuse herself and there was one day when she was looking through the big huge windows on the second floor looking out some sunshine it's a pretty day and there's a huge balcony that uh, runs along between the floors and uh, she just wanted to go out and out and play and that's when several people who were approaching the restaurant noticed a a toddler out walking around the balcony. Oh my goodness! So they, they rushed inside and said, "Look, what's the kid doing on the balcony?" So really? the parents rush up, and my gosh, the windows open. Lindsay's out there. Of course, they pull her back in, close that huge window, and of course, ask the obvious. Lindsay, how did you get out there? Uh, well, Morlock opened the window for me because I want to go outside and play. Morlock. Morlock. Yeah. Morlock. 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 And that's yep. the name she came up with. It has nothing to do with uh, any other uh, uh, connection. It's just that's what she called this particular spirit. And her father asked a description, and she described uh, kind of a tall, lean, gray-haired man who uh, smoked cigars. And that kind of clicked with her dad because he frequently smelled cigar smoke in various places in the uh, in the building. And, of course, nobody was smoking cigars. Oh, wow. But uh, the fact was, she was out on the balcony. There's no way that little child could open that double hung window. Dan and I seen these windows. There's no way. And there was nobody upstairs to open it. But nonetheless, it was open. Uh, so that was kind of how all this began. Wow. Uh, fascinating. Cheapers. So that's a serious childhood experience and an experience that was actually confirmed by her parents because they see yes. her, they, yes. you know. Uh, Malak is, I, you know, saying it's not connected, but I, I think there is some history behind Malak as a name itself. Um, going back to, uh, um, I, I don't know if it's the Kabbalah or ancient Greece. Well, this uh, was, was it, 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 was more, it wasn't Malak, it was Morlock. Morlock with an R. Morlock. That's more. what I, okay, I, I I'd asked yeah. you if it was an R. In yeah, it. and she, 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 that's just the name she came up with. She doesn't reference any knowing it. That's just what she called this figure. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So the spirit intervention, she ends up outside, and things don't stop there. Yeah, one of the, the interesting things about uh, Lindsay's story is the the uh, the action of the spirit world on the UFO phenomenon. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll, let, I'll introduce George again on this, but uh, the, the way that George and I got involved in the Lindsay's case, Lindsay's case was actually stage managed by a spirit, spirit of an American actress named Kate Bateman, who uh, passed away in the... Uh, what, early 1900s, George? 1917. Okay, yeah. Anyway, uh, she is the one she, from the spirit world who, who actually, actually basically motivated uh, Lindsay to contact George and to get involved <clears throat> with, with me on investigating her case. So the, it's a UFO case, but the investigators got involved by a, the intervention of the spirit world. And George can handle that part. Yeah, there's a chapter in the book called The Stage Manager, which, um, uh, well, if you're familiar with the term stage manager, that's the person who runs a, thea a theatrical production after opening night. You know, director's out of the picture, stage manager controls what's going on. And um, 
As a little side note, uh, in, in a few hours, I'll be going to the Shreveport Little Theater to portray the role of the stage manager in the play Our Town. So there's a lot of okay. a lot of subtleties going on here. Uh, sure. Uh, Kate, <clears throat> we, we, we are very confident in Kate's existence. We, we had two very fine uh, evidential mediums join our team. We had that cross check with those those talents. And uh, we had some sessions where Kate presented herself and was able to give the information she wanted on behalf of the book and kind of fessed up that, yeah, we all know each other. We've been doing this for gosh knows how many centuries or thousands of years. And yet Kate's been kind of real close with Lindsay all her life and yeah, kind of put the little bug in her ear. Yeah, now's the time to do this. OK, listen to this podcast so you get this information and oh, will you be sure and call George? I mean, it's just amazing how wow. it unfolded. So that's interesting. So the evidential mediums were able to confirm that this was Kate Bateman um, yep. that you were speaking with and that Kate had some kind of past and future information. The way, the way she presented the, the she was very clever. How do, how do I get their attention? And at the, when we were doing the, the bulk of the research, uh, I was in a routine of getting up early in the morning, usually just before dawn or around dawn, and taking a morning walk. Uh, from my house down to Mike Wood Park in Bossier City. <clears throat> That's a very large park, but it's also adjacent to the runway at Barksdale Air Force Base, and that may have some bearing on some things. But I was taking a walk one frosty morning and stopped at the baseball field and said, oh, that's a pretty picture. Let me get my phone and take a picture of that, and I'll post it on Facebook as a scene on this morning stroll thing. And I did. And I got some response from a lot of folks. I said, oh, George, that's just beautiful. Well, what's with the blue tennis ball, huh? I hadn't even noticed. I went back and looked at the, the photo, and sure enough, uh, hovering above the um, uh, the frost was a blue orb. <laughs> and I go, oh, wow. That's got to be a lens flare or something. I mean, because the sun's up, and so we got some light. Uh, so I kind of blew it off, but uh, made these walks pretty much every day when the weather was, was permitting, and I had an idea. Well, let me just recreate that picture. I'll stop the same place get the same frame and just take a picture and see what happens. And there's an orb. And that kept repeating and about five or six times. And okay, all right, something's going on. I can't see it. I do not see the orb. You don't see what the horizon is. It's just no, in the but the camera will, cur capture, will, it. will capture it. So I'm I sure. sent a series of photographs over to Dan and said, look, Dan, <laughs> get out your biggest pendulum. <laughs> and see if you can come up with what is going on here because it's too consistent to be accidental and then uh, what's it all about well dan meditated cogitated did his witchcraft with the, the, the rock on a string or whatever he did but he came back with the orb is the spirit it is a spirit known to you that's me but not in this lifetime and okay um and then I had an impulse. Uh, let me start looking for 19th century American actresses. And as I did, I kept coming up with references to Kate Bateman. Kate Bateman <clears throat> got into some specific um, reviews and articles back in the day uh, and from the 19th century where she was a you know, theatrical family who traveled all around the country and all that she was in New Orleans and December of 1860 at St. Charles Theater doing Juliet and Romeo and Juliet. Wow. And shortly thereafter, she married an Englishman, George Crow, relocated to uh, London and was a very, very famous uh, actress on the London stage uh, for much of the rest of the uh, 19th century. Interesting. Uh, Any relation to Jason Bateman? Yeah, oh my God, I thought the same thing. <laughs> I, I love Jason Bateman's work in Ozarks. Yes. And the rest of uh, the I do too, as a matter of fact. I haven't, I haven't checked on that, but... Uh, no, it's a theatrical family, so who knows? Who knows? It's possible right. sometimes. Yeah. Things but at any rate, right, so um, that, uh, okay, Dan, just take a swing. Is Kate Bateman the the, the person is that uh, is appearing as this blue, sparkly, or it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful orb. There's a picture of it in the book. And he got a, a definite yes, and I set up a specific session with uh, Colleen Laborde, uh, a practicing evidential medium, mm -hmm. and specifically, uh, it was, what does Kate <laughs> want us to do? What's she going to have to say? And 
that was a session where we kind of learned that she's been involved with everybody involved with this particular investigation and that she's kind of pulling things together and moving things along. Uh, For our audience who who wouldn't know, when you say evidential medium, this is a medium, obviously, as the name applies, is looking for evidence. So they're looking for uh, Kate, the spirit, uh, her, yeah, well, something that yeah, yeah. nobody else could possibly know, right? Uh, the, the, the participation of the medium was not in her role as evidential. That's just that's her main business is evidential. And basically, that's connecting grieving people with their departed loved ones with evidence that only those two would know and uh so she has that experience behind her so we're talking about pretty serious medium you know, oh, a lot oh of, very very much so uh, uh she, she's highly vetted uh there were some um well my ex-wife and some other folks uh made a point to come through her if you will to satisfy my my curiosity yes okay she's the real deal and yes we are getting some accurate uh information in this particular channel so had high degree of confidence uh, in the information we got from not only her, but also another participant's uh, wife had the same skill. So uh, it was a nice it was a nice team. So we could cross check a lot of the information until we felt very comfortable uh, that we got something that's valid here. Strange as it may be. Understandable. <laughs> yeah, let me let me drop in something here real quick. Uh, speaking of uh, television series and television shows, Kate was something that uh, playing uh, Mission Impossible with us on the other side. I think she was, she was sitting there. She's got, the, she's got the book there. Like, all right, who do I need to help out with this case at this particular time? Well, I'll bring George in. I'll bring Dan in. And while we were going through this process, she kept flipping through that book because, uh, for example, uh, people kept joining the, the joining the quest out of, out of the blue. Uh, I've got a good friend, Dave McMillan, who's in radio in the area, and we were doing a radio interview. And oh, by the way, Dave says I'm I'm uh, pendulum dowser. I do uh, I make my own pendulums. Oh, and my wife is a medium. Bam! All of a sudden, two brand new members <laughs> to the team out, out of the blue. George already has his, his connection with uh, the evidential medium, and we had a couple of other uh, very astute uh, educators and business people who just appeared out of somewhere out of nowhere. So we had a whole team. By the time we were really getting into the investigation part of this process, we had a whole very, very, very talented group of people helping us out. And that's yeah. all from this manipulation, uh, good manipulation from the spirit world. Yeah, and all, these people are listed in the book, of course. Yeah. We it's, call, yeah, it's synchronicity. That's what we call that. Yeah, the synchronicity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A whole yeah. lot going on. Our, yes. A circling around uh, would be. Do uh, you think it's like a game plan plan in the afterlife? Like perhaps um, the spirit wanted to put this whole thing together because they could see the the past, few, uh, present, and future, mm -hmm. and they have some sort of mission to do so. Well, this yeah, this thing goes back. Uh, all right, uh, hold on to your hats. This goes back about six thousand years when the uh, the spirit of the uh, the woman who is now incarnated as uh, Lindsay Higgins made an agreement on a spiritual plane that she would reincarnate throughout history with the goal of slowly bit by bit improving improving the human condition. And so this has been a process that's been going on for 6,000 years. Somewhere along the way, George and I apparently got involved and we are in this incarnation very active in putting the whole story together. But this goes way, way, way back. And what's interesting is the, uh, the, the spirit who brought Lindsay into that agreement uh, is the spirit of the principal extraterrestrial who has been overseeing this entire process all this time. And we had many, many conversations with this uh, individual. We, we, just for simplicity's sake, he let us call him E.T. or her or whoever it is. Uh, so we had, quite a, day. Yeah. we had quite a lot of conversation with the extraterrestrial as to what they're doing, why they're doing it, and getting the scale of the thing. and. Uh, it, it's not what people would usually expect. That's fascinating. It, as in, what do you mean by that? It's not what they expect. Well, I'm going to, that's your cue, Dan, for <laughs> Lauren at a moment. <laughs> again, yeah, again, you, you think in terms of uh, entire lifetimes, uh, not just decades, but millennia. But the idea is to, over time, 
improve the human condition so that our lifespan is extended perhaps as much as uh, I believe 150 years is kind of what they're shooting for, but primarily to enhance or uh, I think bring back the psychic ability that is in, innate in the human being so that we can uh, not only communicate better with each other, but better communicate with the entities that are out there. And do you think that they're always out there and maybe uh, they are more here and we just can't see well, them? When I, well, yeah, when I say out there, I mean, you know, outside. Our perception. Our perception. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, and then the, the like a lot of them might be interdimensional. Sorry, George. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, well, in a session I had with uh, Colleen specifically, it was her impression of E.T. And what she presented was this is an extremely highly evolved spirit. Um, capable of being wherever it wants to be. It can't take any form. It needs to be in any environment for any reason. But she was real uh, just enthralled with the the level of spiritual involvement. And Dan uh, caught a piece of that in a session at Mike Woods Park with uh, David and his his wife, Lauren. And why don't you tell about that, Dan? Because that got that that got you involved, and that was unusual. Yeah, I'm a I'm a pendulum dowser. I'm not a medium. I'm not a, I'm not a clairaudient, clairvoyant. All I can do is swing a rock on a string. But we had a session in the park there. We had uh, George, George was there. I was there. Uh, Dave McMillan was there. Lauren was there. At kind of a half circle, and uh, ET showed up, and uh, Lauren was getting the impression of, for lack of a better term, pur a purple glow, a purple haze, purple smoke beautiful gorgeous color purple and uh i looked over to her and i said lauren do you feel that she said yeah and it was uh i can only describe it well lauren described it best when she said i am feeling mother love and uh, if you look at the transcript uh in, in the book you have you know dan says i'm about to tear up here the the the, the emotion coming from empty space directly in front of me and lauren was overwhelming, overwhelming love. It was incredible. So you can't fake it. You can't generate that kind of feeling. It was just there. Right. right. And Undeniable. Was, yeah, and that was a that was a response to a specific request that was made. Would it be possible for ET to present himself at this time? And that's what Lauren picked up on. Oh, wow. Excellent. That's that, that is amazing. It really is. It is. No, yeah, it's you, had to, you had to be there to experience it. But it, uh, again, the, the feeling was uh, it's, it's not something you could hope for and generate and, and create because you want the moment. I mean, it was it was there. Absolutely. We believe you have been in kind of situations like that. You have to yeah. be there to feel the emotions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, wow. All right. So you're talking to to spirit uh we're talking about aliens uh we see a, a tie-in to the childhood um you use a pendulum to to uh, navigate these questions and and everybody is feeling the emotions around it uh is there anything special just a side note uh for our audience pendulums often come with different rocks and metals and, and certain things on chain strings some people doesn't matter needle. can you just use <laughs> Uh, a piece of yarn and a rock, or does is anything yeah, I, matter? Yeah, 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 let me tell you a true story. A, 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 a pendulum is a rock on a string. I went out on a session in Arizona, going to a very old old graveyard, going to do some research. Got out of my truck, forgot my pendulum. I had my whole kit, but I had taken my pendulum out the night before and hadn't put it back in. Had yeah, how are you going to conduct a, 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 a not a séance? How are you going to conduct a, a session without your pendulum? Well, no, no problem. Went back to my truck, got my knife, <clears throat> cut off a shoestring from one of my tennis shoes, reached down, picked up a rock, tied it off, and that was my pendulum for the day, and it worked perfectly. That is <laughs> amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah if, if you're if you're wanting to buy a pendulum, pick the pretty one. <laughs> Just one you like. It yeah. doesn't pick really the one you like. All right, that's that, great. that's fantastic. Yeah. It is. So, is all of this giving you a sort of a sense of what the afterlife is? A peek at it, just a peek. And what do you see? Uh, well, George came up with something really interesting. Uh, he read something in a book where a, a spirit had said to in, in communication that uh, over there, uh, I feel like I'm everywhere at once, and it's wonderful. 
And we kept asking that question during the research, different spirits at different times in different locations. And apparently, once you cross over, you feel like you're every place at once, and it's wonderful. Interesting. We've heard people say that before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it reminds Indeed. us of a, like astral projection experiences yes. where you just seem to will yourself to be anywhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So out of body yes. type experiences. NDEs talk about this, of course. Um, well, that's, that's fascinating. Definitely yeah, yeah. One, of the, one of the things that we kept getting is that once you cross over, you know, it's not you get a pitchfork or you get your wings, you know. Yeah, it's like no. they're, they're, it's, they're, they're levels and levels and levels and options and options and options depending on where your spiritual development is, where your emotional tags are, and what you want to do with the rest of your life. I think it's really interesting. One of the things paranormal investigators talk about a lot is like in rescue mediums, we'll talk about things like uh, earthbound spirits, mm-hmm. spirits that are trapped here because they feel like they have to be here either through like a violent death, something, something traumatic, something yeah. traumatic yeah. happened, fear of judgment that they are going to kind of, you know, hit Anubis's scales or Osiris yeah. scales with the heart and the feather and be judged wrong, you know, and, and have to suffer in a uh, purgatory or hell. Yeah. Um, and yet other people are able to talk to their grandmother or something like that. It was clearly coming from a place of love. Mm-hmm. Yeah, much of the conversation we, we gleaned uh, from was from Lindsay's favorite aunt, who she spent a lot of time with growing up. And Aunt Belle was just so happy to be involved with this particular project. Um, so that was very personal uh, for Lindsay. And uh, and that's where a lot of our, our, our good information came about uh, what all was going on with Lindsay as a child living on a certain property. Um, uh, now, with respect to spirits on, on, on Earth, um, also in the book, we find out that young Lindsay is not only seeing, if you will, shadow people and craft and other beings, uh, but she was also seeing um, the spirits of some Native Americans. Um, the land that she was living on, that her father purchased, apparently was a very old piece of land, had a, had a freshwater spring, that uh, a geologist uh, says has been, been there for 100,000 years, long time, ancient piece of ground, high ground, South Shreveport. And we picked up that uh, some of the spirits that Lindsay was seeing were the spirits of the Caddo Indians who lived in that area back in the day. And that's your cue again, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, one of the that's a fascinating story in itself. But one of the interesting things, as you you mentioned, being trapped, uh, we encountered, uh, I believe it was six Native American spirits. Uh, that land was, it's not sacred or holy, but it's important to the cattle tribe. And uh, we encountered uh, six, yes, I believe it was six Native American spirits, uh, warrior farmers, who were not trapped but they had self-assigned themselves to the property where Lindsay grew up. And they, they were some of, the, some of the images that she saw growing up of the shadow people, whatever. That's who some of them were. And in the conversation we had with them, uh, we explained to them, you know, you guys don't have to stay here anymore. You know, the, the property owners now respect the property. They're going to take care of it. Uh, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to be there. They had told us they were there because they felt a responsibility to the land, uh, not because they were trapped or afraid to cross over. So, you know, we talked with them, and we had a medium with them. Lauren was with us, and, you know, three of them decided, well, okay, we can we can cross over now. You know, and three of them decided to stay and, you know, basically keep an eye on the land. But three of them crossed over. And wow. as we were, yeah, as we were leaving that day, leaving the property, Getting in a car, uh, Lauren looked back and said, "Oh, look, the three Indians are waving at us. So they're <laughs> waving goodbye at us." Wow! Wow! That's a uh, wonderful story. My goodness! And uh, that, yeah, they were they were here, but they weren't. And they were staying here, but they weren't trapped here. They were here right. of their own volition. They're of their own volition. Again, yes. that yeah. earth thing. That's another cause, right? People attribute to hauntings and and things of that nature. That the person that is deceased feels some responsibility. It might be like a yes. looking out over a family member or, you know, the location of the, you know, the hidden box of 
treasure in the basement. Or, or they, the they, um, they yeah. built the house themselves and they don't want to leave. They don't yeah. want to come back. We actually did a residential case, Chris and I, with someone like that. So well, yeah, you yeah. probably run into the, in the, in this before, but in a lot of my research, I, I've, I've asked the spirits, you know, you know, you're over there where everything is wonderful. Why, you know, why are you back here on Earth? You know, you're not you're not trapped here. You're here by your own free will. Mm -hmm. And consistently, they said, I want to relive a happy experience. And I want uh, several times I used the, the word. I said, Well, is that like taking a vacation? And they go, Yeah. Oh boy, that's wow. very so, interesting. Yeah. Like taking a vacation. But the indigenous people, you know, are often pointed to, or I, I don't want to say blame for a lot of hauntings, right? Um, in our area, we're just outside, just now, outside of the the Bridgewater Triangle, for example, mm -hmm. it's yeah. just this area where King Philip's War raged, mm -hmm. which is much larger actually than the the triangle that it's people south, point yeah. to. Yeah, it's all through New England, including where we are, and it you know it's like the scarification of the land and that these spirits, this blood in the soil is yeah, an attribution, yeah. but it always seems so angry. And I, I lo love what you said, because that's the first time I've ever heard yeah. anybody reference the, the indigenous folk as just wanting to maintain the land. <laughs> they wanted to make sure the land was okay. They didn't want to leave. Sacred. And that's know, beautiful. To them. So, yeah, that's, that's what they, their thing is, you know, the land, everything, the wind, just everything. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. see them looking over the land. Yeah, that, that's. I, I ran into a situation. Uh, I go camping a lot, and a lot of my camping is at Native American sites. And I've run into several times where I've actually met a spirit at a site, and who has basically, in the course of the conversation, said, "Just I'm here because I feel a responsibility to this place. Yeah, I'm not here to scare anybody or to frighten anybody. I just I'm connected to the place. I have a responsibility for it." It's amazing. Excellent. And it's also mention of hybrid children in, in your bio. Yeah, you George, you know more about that than I do. Well, uh, Lindsay just had a sense that with all the activities going on with her over time, that uh, she had a one or possibly two hybrid children. And uh, that came from her. She had some flashbacks of some procedures. Um, that would involve what we would uh, recognize as removing uh, eggs at a certain age and then uh, the zygote being reinserted for a period of time and then fully removed at a certain time. And she just had just sense that that has what had occurred. And Aunt Bell confirmed it and said, yes, uh, you have had two children, two hybrid children, and you have met them, but you didn't know that you met them. And that kind of was intriguing for her. Um, this is a um, it's a tough subject because looking at looking at it, it you know the the person like um, Lindsay isn't asking for this to happen to her. Um, well, that's what it well, she, she had, yeah, but yeah, but she agreed to it six thousand yeah. years ago. She agreed to it six thousand years ago. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's not in this present lifetime. We're looking at a past life. You're looking at a very long continuum yeah. of related events, so it's 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 not random. There's there's a there's a definite method to the perceived madness. It's just a pattern. Wow, six thousand years ago. Is, uh, that, that's that's we're, what they tell us. Yep, that is fascinating. Yeah, we, we were just this. watching uh, Graham Hancock, who loves to oh, yes. talk oh, about yes. innovations <laughs> last night. Graham and, is uh, a mentor to to me. We love Graham. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, George and I met him up in Sedona. Oh, Is that right? Oh, really? Yeah. We nice story. guy. Well, he was talking about a case, I think, in San Diego. It was about a mastodon in North America. Um, I knew we've heard this before, and I guess the mastodon was recovered in a way the bones were broken in the mastodon. It had been consumed by um, people, humans, right, mm -hmm. in North America, and that this was like about I think, 125 or 150,000 years ago, which, mm -hmm. of course most mainstream science does not agree with so where where was lindsay six thousand years ago does she know on a plane geography on a, on a plane like uh, around like in north america europe like or earth. what wasn't she wasn't an earth thing if this was this, okay. this is a higher oh. spiritual plane like a higher yeah, plane. Not, not an airplane spiritual plane spiritual Ever. plane gotcha and we didn't explore that area because we were we were concentrating on what's happening right now all right. Okay. I mean, I'm picturing her being this sort of, uh, you know, 
living on, on terrestrial or terra firma. So <laughs> thank you for explaining that spiritual plane. I missed that part. Um, wow. Wow. So the, the, she's impregnated by a, another uh, being. A, we think uh, we're calling it aliens, you know, like a hybrid children. And what became well, of the well, children? We didn't go into detail. <clears throat> so we don't know what the manipulation was uh, with her egg and whatever whatever counterpart they had had to uh, to, to um, use. Um, so uh, that would have gone off in another rabbit hole and taken yeah. us away from the core of the of the what research. Were, we, were, we were very disciplined in staying focused because it was, I mean, it's, you could, this could have gone so, so many ways and it never would have ended. Yes. Yeah. What we is, understand that. <laughs> what are some of the things she did see in, in this lifetime? With the abduction phenomenon. By the way, you mentioned that you didn't like that word abduction. Yes. Well, in Lindsay's case, yeah, it, it's because uh, abduction, um, that, that's a specific word that implies criminal intent. Right. Okay, a criminal action. And that does not appear to be what is occurring with Lindsay. She has regular, well, not always regular, but she's had continued, we would call visitation. Sometimes it's physical. Sometimes it's astral. Uh, sometimes whatever's being worked with with Lindsay has to occur in an environment uh, that would be totally non-threatening to her. Therefore, that may be why uh, she goes into a craft and a craft goes to a certain place for whatever is being accomplished. Uh, whereas other times uh, they can work with her uh, spirit, so to speak, uh, while she's asleep at home. Uh, they'll leave some little telltale markings so that she will know that, okay, we were here. There's a chapter on that in the book. Um, so it's not, it's... Uh, is it like a scarification to let her know that they were there? How yeah, was uh, yeah, it's not permanent marking, but uh, okay. in, the, in the Netflix episode, they they replicate some of the uh, the geometric patterns that she would find on her arm or her thigh or her stomach or whatnot, and they they fade away after a few hours. But just it's a calling know, card, a calling here. card, just to see exactly, yeah. What did like, they look like? Well, it was some uh, kind of symbiology without giving away too much, of course. Any religious iconography or anything like that? Or? No, no. She described geometric shapes, tri triangles, squares, circles. Uh, sometimes it'll be kind of little red dots where maybe there was an apparatus that was uh, uh, applied to the physical body and just leaves a little little residual, kind of like a mosquito bite or something. It fades. Sure, sure. Yep. We've talked to folks. Yeah, th that part of her story is pretty typical from what you read in the literature. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we did find something rather interesting in, in one of our sessions. Apparently, the uh, you know some of the the, uh, the uh, again the abduction experiences was extremely painful. She, you know she was undergoing serious pain, and uh, we were discussing this and we were discussing it with the ETs, and you know she agreed to go through that, and it was let, we we're letting Lindsay ask the question, but she asked the question, well I've agreed to do this, can we do this without the pain? And we got a yes response from the pendulum. And uh, George can confirm this, but since, uh, yeah, they're almost neighbors. Since that moment, she's had several visitations, but none, none of the pain, none of the pain has returned. Oh, that's great. So that's good. They, uh, from what we gather, and this is speculation on our part, but the entities doing the painful experiment didn't realize they were causing pain. They, they may not have the emotional ability to to recognize the difference between, say, pain and laughter. They may not know. Wow. But when she asked to stop, they stopped. That's interesting. Yeah, but it was essential that she make the request. Yeah. Okay. And uh, she reports that, uh, that might there be. have been some visitation since, um, since the investigation ended, and um, there was no associated pain. So this may have been uh, what was causing her extreme abdominal discomfort as a young child and early teen because uh, she was hospitalized and I mean every battery of tests was possible you know, was run that would uh, seek out some sort of diagnosis to describe what she's experiencing nothing best that they could come up with is when she was young uh, her mother was dying of cancer and she was just doing this to get attention of course that's nonsense but oh, it's awful uh, test tests just just dis disclose no no diagnosis. There's, there's nothing wrong with her, but she's got this terrible pain. And that, that's revealed in the Netflix episode because 
both her friend and her cousin were well aware of how much she was uh, was hurting. Yeah, having very painful episodes chronically growing up. It's awful. What were they doing to her that was giving her the abdominal we pain? We don't know. Examinations. No idea. Nobody no knows. idea. So it's kind of weird. Like uh, a lot of people are split in the U- ufology world. You know about whether these things into uh, abduction phenomena experiences are good or bad. And we've talked to people on both sides that claim to, to have been abducted, have these experiences behind them. Um, if you watch Communion, you know, with Whitley Street, yeah. you might ask yourself, like, why, why does Whitley go back at the end? It seemed yeah, like can't he went through a, <laughs> through a lot of stuff that most people would really run away from, but he feels, mm-hmm. still feels drawn or compelled to uh, work with these uh, aliens, if you will. I, how do you guys feel about that? Like, what is your experience? It seems like, like, like she likes it, but there's also until she told him, "Hey, stop hurting me." The, they they didn't know, you know. And then you can look at like well, Adam, it wasn't until this was investigation like necessarily that. that she associated the pains yeah. with the visitations. Hmm. Okay. All right. But you know, she had these problems as a child. Certainly other people, you know, have uh, talked about things happening to them that can be all sorts of natures and um, some good, some bad. But a a lot of people that even uh, have described these sort of negative experiences, uh, not unlike Whitley, want to continue them. Like there's something in it for them. There's some gratification. And it's it's fascinating. And then other people will be like, hey, why are they doing this? This isn't good. Uh, we can only address Lindsay's specific case. That's what we investigated. So, you know, it could sure. be different for other people. Sure. I'm not be- bring up oh, Willie. It's just the uh, yeah, example a lot of people simple. are familiar with. Yeah. We've talked to a lot of people like that, you know, that really are continue to have the experiences, aren't unhappy about it, but also describe things that seem like, wow, I, I wouldn't really want that to happen. Mm-mm. You know, well, yeah, there, 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 there's another possible tie in here with the, um, the, the spirit connection. Like, uh, George and I frequently say we've been doing this. I've been doing this for more than 20 years, and I have you know, investigating the, the spirit world. I've never had a negative encounter. I've never had a get out you know, or spooky oh, wow. or anything like that experience. Mm-hmm. And I think that the, the main reason is I don't go looking for them. Yeah, and when, intent, when George and I go out looking, you know, we, we expect a pleasant experience. We're going to somebody's house or somebody's place of business or somebody's place and we're, we're saying hey we're neighbors we would like to chat with you so yeah our, no, our, our experiences are pleasant yeah. because we look for it yeah so yeah I, yeah people go into haunted houses looking for something to scare them they're looking for a thrill and maybe they get it right so but a, another person who's like maybe sitting with a medium or maybe having maybe what we'll call it quote unquote new age experience they're going to have something pleasant happen to them that may reflect in the afterlife mm-hmm. well, look at, yeah look at it this way you, you, uh, and this this happened you know uh, several times with this if you go into a haunted house quote haunted house mm-hmm. and you in some and the spirit say taps you on the side of your head if you're expecting a, a negative experience a demon just slapped you if you're right. expecting a positive experience oh hey the ghost is trying to get my attention what's yeah. going on right my cat does that right my cat yeah, exactly yeah <laughs> So like, wants my attention. If, They're not negative. If George, and, if, if George and I hear three, three taps on the wall, we don't go, that's the devil. We go, hey, somebody's knocking to get our attention. Right, exactly. Thank you. I, I love it, that this came up. Because, yes, we have a know, thing we call so it the credit are pigeonholed and, you know, it, uh, Granted, yeah. we have some kind of spooky-looking things behind us, and we, yeah. we yeah. like yeah. phenomena. Yeah. But, no, I, I agree with you. Not everything is, you know, a demon yeah. or negative or what, whatever. But it, yeah, and there's an, example, there's an example that we had uh, not – in this investigation, but in while doing some sessions for Dan's previous books, um, we were at the Spring Street Museum, which is the city of Shreveport's uh, historical museum. And we were downstairs, which is where the offices are. And it was me, Dan, uh, the curator of the museum, uh, the female then administrator who's seated on the steps coming down. And we were uh, conversing with one of the brothers who founded the building back in the mid 19th century, because uh, uh, historically, uh, the presence of those particular brothers uh, is very well sensed by people in the museum, especially the staff or anybody who's frequents it. So 
uh, Dan was able to use the pendulum, and uh, we had a lively, lively chat uh, with uh, with Ben. And um, at one point, um, the Maria uh, sitting on the steps just went, "Whoa!" <laughs> <laughs> Somebody just brushed my hair, and uh, so we asked, "Oh, well, Ben, did you did you mess with her hair?" Yes. He's <laughs> <laughs> cute, you know that type of thing. But you know, if if she believed in, um, she was halfway to hell, then you know it would have been a demon trying to you know whatever. Absolutely, absolutely, so absolutely. We, did, we did get you know the spirit said yes, I did that, and in this whole process we had quite a number of instances uh, where they're kind of displaying what they can do from that particular side. And there was one very intriguing uh, episode uh, involving an EVP uh, mm -hmm. at the same uh, museum in a different session. We were working with a, uh, a family that we were led to in the in, Shreveport's oldest cemetery, a family we had to meet in order to tell Lindsay's story. And we were asking uh, this Ben spirit uh, to describe the family that we were meeting just to get some information about uh, how the wife, uh, a description so we could present it to Lindsay, see if anything resonated. And that evening when Dan and I were listening to the recording, because we record everything, now we're getting the conversation. Okay, that's a yes. That's a no. Here's a question. Here's a yes. That's a no. Then all of a sudden, in a very firm male voice, Lindsay is key. Whoa, hello. Whoa. <laughs> Play that again. <laughs> and there it is. Lindsay is key. Whoa, whoa. Oh. Play that again, Dan. <laughs> Lindsay is key. So we, we replayed it about half a dozen times. There was just no two ways about it. And weeks later, Dan's back in Arizona and he's doing the transcript from that session. And he's playing back the tape, and the EVP is gone. It's not there. Come on. Oh, really? Well, it, it wasn't there. Yeah, and when next Dan was in, in Shreveport, we were having a, a part of the investigation, having a session with this, this fellow, W.D. Woodworth. He's quite a character. Uh, and so we asked, uh, did you do the EVP to Lindsay is key? Yes. Oh. Did you remove it? <laughs> yes. Oh, <my> <laughs> Uh, so that's just a demonstration of how they can manipulate things. And oh, uh, there, yes. was, there we'll were some other, other things that cropped up. But that in particular was, well, you wouldn't think that an electronic recording, they can put something in and take something out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. They can. Or was it ever really there? And the and manipulation was your. Oh, yeah, it could be. Could be. But it, we are written, again, George and I played that thing back uh, at least half a dozen times. Mm -hmm. I mean, we and every time you played it, you heard it. Mm -hmm. but, and then it wasn't there. Yeah, no, I believe you. I, we have oh, had we have had that happen. We definitely no, no one, no one, yeah, no one can. We became had similar things, though, where our perceptions, right, were, yes. were yeah. manipulated, and like, oh wow, you know, just a real quick example. I, we had um, Kristen here listening to headphones like this, like noise canceling headphones, mm -hmm. with a recorder, and we're walking together in a haunted location, and somebody yells, "Hello!" Who scares the crap out of us? Now everything that Kristen can hear is coming through that recorder. It's coming through those microphones. And would you believe hello was not on a recording? It wasn't there. And it was both so loud, out. echoed, what, and what we the both heck was that? You know, that kind of thing. So it's like our perceptions no, were, were manipulated, but there, it wasn't even it's on the recording. Weird. So that's why I don't think we're, why we're just reacting so strongly to what, yes. that statement. Mm -hmm. yes. I totally believe you in the phenomena, because I think these things can happen. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, keep in mind also, WD, uh, it was, he's quite a character. He was, that that's something that uh, it's in his personality to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Because he can. Because you have such yeah. a personality to be uh, a sort of something that occurs a lot. This kind of trickster spirit. Yeah. 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 A lot of people talk about trickster spirits almost to the point of them being like a, um, I don't want to say stereotype, but like a, uh, what did Young say about the repeating, uh, I don't know, like, like a character that you would see. Get on the couch and tell me about your mother. Is that what the no, it's Sigmund Freud. <laughs> <laughs> WD liked his libation. Let me put it that way. Oh, oh, okay. So oh, yeah. do you give him okay. offerings and <laughs> of the libations? Oh uh, no. no, no, no. But well, part part of the phenomenon of this investigation was the reincarnation angle that Lindsay's current family, her father, her her sister, and Lindsay, 
in their most immediate incarnation was as W.D. Woodworth, his daughters, Mabel and Sally Murph. So they're retaining the same roles in an almost identical incarnation very soon after the, the previous. And um, that was that was intriguing because I recall a specific session when Dan and I were with Lindsay. Mm -hmm. And um, at the same time, we were also communicating with the spirit of Sally Murph Woodworth. Lindsay in her previous incarnation. So we're talking we're, we're talking directly with physical Lindsay, but we're also communicating with Lindsay's spirit as Sally Murph at the same time. Uh, wow. And that's uh, that's a phenomenon that that uh, is, is probably more common than certainly at the time I would thought. Well, I called it stacking at that time just to show it, you know, there are the different levels of consciousness. Stacking, yes. OK, I like that. Sure. But we were communicating with multiple consciousness in different time frames. So uh, it really makes life interesting. It's, it's sure harder does. than we ever thought. <laughs> it's true. It's a, it's a very big universe out there. Yes, very you know, much. These so. archetypes, but you're talking about it's like fragments of the same person that are mm -hmm. aspects, mm -hmm. yeah, just yeah, exactly very much so. simultaneously. So <laughs> we, it's possible that we have other lives going on in different timelines, and we don't yes. understand well, yet. All exist like possibly that. in different dimensions. Yeah, and looking back, okay. looking back, going back to the uh, the orbs on the on the field, Mike Woods far. By the way, they still continue to show. I mean, Kate pops in uh, frequently, but there were also okay. other other individuals who were showing up in some of those photographs and W.D. Woodward, Dan and I discovered, um, was one of the orbs that looked a little different. Uh, it had some dark lines across it, had some fissures and was, what, what, what is this? I mean, this was a time when we were uh, trying to get our heads wrapped around this concept of stacking. And I think what WD was presenting <clears throat> was a pictorial illustration of the orb as the total self with portions of it elsewhere. Okay. That being the uh, the fissures or the streaks or whatnot. That's kind of what I gleaned from it, that it was trying to show us that, hey, I'm here, but part of me can also be over there and over there and over there, over there. It's certainly this concept of linear time is just a, a human experience yeah. here, and this here and now. So you're talking to something that lived 6,000 years ago, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. but is talking to you in real time mm -hmm. here in our 3D matrix world, if you will. Yeah, we had conversations. We had conversations with a medicine man uh, who was living 4,000 years ago at uh, Poverty Point in Louisiana, World Heritage site of Mound Builders. It was a huge, huge, historically important site. But we're we're going back in time and conversing with that that medicine man. Oh, it's wonderful. And did he know? he was dead in our world or was he just talking from his world? Well, um, we were communicating with the spirit of a, a man who was very familiar with poverty point, worked with the uh, archeologists when they were doing some of the big research back in the eighties. Uh, he was of such a an assistance um, that when they were writing up their findings, which I read, at the end, they had a special tribute to him, um, not being a scientist per se, but he worked so closely with them. He was like, dig here. You're going to find the midden here. Um, the, the authors wrote a tribute that on the big mound at Poverty Point, on a dark night, one can imagine uh, the medicine man up there wrapped in his feathered robe. And uh, that was the image that uh, was created by this individual for his incarnation 4,000 years ago. So in a sense, we're we're dealing with a lifetime 4,000 years ago, but we're going through the same spirit in a more contemporary uh, incarnation. Sure. Wow. It's yeah, I think the answer, if, if, I, if I hear you right, answer part of your question, the deceased that we've talked to know they're deceased. They are. They do. Yeah, they, they, they're, they're completely aware of it. Uh-huh. One phenomenon we talked about, actually, I think earlier in the week, because we do a Thursday show as well, that came up that was kind of fascinating <laughs> related to this, is sometimes you're getting a conversation almost between two spirits, entities, what have you. Yes. They're completely unaware that you're even listening, and 
they're just going on talking to each other, talking to each other, having this conversation that just you you don't know what time frame Where? to reference. Where? Are they um, sure. deceased <laughs> or living just a different uh, existence? You know, living in another dimension, if you will. Yeah, well, I think in that situation, you know, people call this uh, uh, cycling or re- repetitive events. I think time, the time over there is entirely different from the time here. And uh, what people are experiencing is just people dropping in, having a good time. Uh, and uh, you just, you know, you're just running into that. Uh, you know, the, the conversations we've had have been direct between us and the spirits. And I've never run into where I'm overhearing another conversation, but I'm sure that, that, could, that could happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that yeah. makes. Yeah, you know, they're they're back here again. They're, they're, you know, the the continuing card game at you know at the Birdcage Theater. They they talk about. It's probably just uh, guys coming back to play cards. They're not trapped here. They're they're they they're you know they're back going playing cards and drinking whiskey with uh, Doc Holiday, just having a ball. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it's almost their expectation. They just keep doing what they were doing. Yeah, and be maybe happy. That, maybe that was something that made them happy in life, and they would just continue to do it in death because that's what they thought happened. I, I think that is. I think that is real common on the when you cross over on the first plane that you you go to, you're still very much attached to the earth, and I think you know some people can move on. Some people are still you know they're not ready to move on, so they you know they either reincarnate or they hang around, visit the earth for a while. Uh, they're not trapped to the earth, but they're they're connected to the earth, and they don't want, quite want to let go yet. Yes, we we agree with you 100 yeah. percent. Yeah, yes. they don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a good example, if, if I got a minute, uh, doing a, a session out at a uh, former ranch out of, uh, east of uh, east of Phoenix. It's an abandoned ranch, but we were doing a session, and it, we were uh, encountered basically a spirit of a guy who was there in the ni- late 1930s. He was a cowhand. He had fallen in love, uh, got married. Uh, the owner of the ranch threw a huge party for him you know, in the barn, and we were in the barn at the time. And uh, curiously, it's a floor, yet we picked up EVPs of boots walking on a wooden floor <laughs> during that session. Wow. That's but, really yeah, cool. He was there. Yeah, he was there uh, having the time of his life. You know, he had, had a good job. Uh, the, the, the economy was good in the country. People were happy. He was marrying the, the sweetheart of his dreams. And then Pearl Harbor comes along. He joins the Marines, crosses over, dies on one of the islands in the Pacific. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we were, and you ask him, you know, why are you, you back here? And he said, I'm, I'm back here. I, I'm, I'm interpreting for him, of course, but the, the, the information we got was, that was the happiest day of his life. He was marrying the, 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 the sweetheart of his dreams. He was with all his buddies. They were passing the jug. They were dancing, playing guitars and fiddles. Happiest day of his life. He comes back to relive that moment because he can. That's excellent. Yeah. That, that is a fascinating way to think about it. You know, that, that is the heaven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What he knows, right? Um, I, another thing we've talked about, like the idea of heaven with NDE experiences are have told us that they are always in this perfect setting for a little while before they come back. Yeah. And it's not necessarily something that they um, experienced, but it, if they could have drawn what heaven was like, it was from their um, thoughts, right? Like they're sitting in the perfect garden as they would have designed it, for example. Yeah. Um, that they didn't have that garden in, in real life, but everything, yeah. you know, they may have had some of the plants and everything was just as they would have wanted it. So it makes me, pe- makes me wonder uh, us wonder what heaven could be, you know, is it going to be something that you haven't experienced or can it be something completely different? Something that you, you never would have thought about. Do you follow what I mean? Like yeah, you, it would relate um, totally to the spirit, you know, the spirit their best was you know and they're continuing to live it you're able to talk to them which is fascinating right yes but it, i think when we're growing up and we have these kind of i don't know it, it, just these images of what heaven and hell are you know yeah. and a lot of that of course is religious based that you're going to enter this plane of something that's just bigger than anything in your own world well we yeah we purpose purposefully stayed away from uh, pursuing the, the quote religious angle of it but like in book two, you know, you have 400 pages of uh, 
what it's like on the other side. You know, very descriptive areas, descriptive uh, passages about what people experience, what they uh, what they go through, what they can and can't do on the other side. And, what are the things that? As I said earlier, they're just uh, the, the options are, are are astounding to me. It sounds it. I that's book. Now, this particular book, let me just put the, the title out. What is the, the title of this particular book? Because I have several books from you guys listed here. And I did want to talk about the different books a little bit. Oh, well, yeah, the one we're discussing today is The Paranormal Pendulum 3, The Abduction of Lindsay Higgins. Uh, the book I just referenced was Paranormal Pendulum 2, What the Spirits Say. Okay. All right. Yes. So you have a, a series of this. Yeah, and, and, uh, and the pend Paranormal Pendulum, the first book, is just it's a how-to book. Great. Great. So, yeah, we're discussing the third in the series now. Oh, all right. All right. I'm sorry. I, I didn't yeah. get that, that point. I just have the list. In fact, I don't see Lindsay mentioned here in the title. I just have it as three. Okay. So you ha have a series of three books, Practical Pendulum, uh, The Paranormal Pendulum, Paranormal Pendulum 2, What the Spirits Say, and Paranormal Pendulum 3, uh, Lindsay Higgins' story. Yeah. Is yeah. Okay. Yeah. don't have that part. Um, oh, fascinating. So this is where the pendulum has taken you guys, huh? Just this little method of information has just been so so true and spot on that it's it's opened up a whole, literally another world to both of you. What are some of the things on, on the other side that people, that, you know, might not expect? Uh, well, I think I think you get what you expect. Mm -hmm. I think you just just flip that. Well. <laughs> the most common thing uh, again was. Uh, the thing George came up with, I feel like I'm everywhere at once, and I love it. Uh, you know, yeah. one, of the, one of the things we learned, you, have, you know, definitely, you know, your, your parents or your friends or whoever relatives are there waiting for you on the other side. Uh, your pets are waiting for you on the other side. Speaking Once you of get that, there, uh, <laughs> you can reincarnate. You can come back and visit the earth. Uh, there are, for lack of a better term, uh, schools or seminars over there where you can continue your spiritual development if you want to right yeah right. You, you, one of your listeners elaine Carr, has come up with i really like dolores cannon's book and uh, i've read yeah. almost all of them and um yeah they're fabulous. There. fabulous yeah 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 exactly um very very related speaking of parents yeah. Yep. So there you go. <laughs> Perfect timing, you, you mean. You. Um, yeah. yeah, one thing I think you get over there, and, and basically, you know, you, you'll go through the, the life review, which apparently is not embarrassing or humiliating. It's a learning experience. And then you get to a point of uh, making a choice. You know, what do you want to do now? Where do you want to go next? What do you think you need to do to develop, to develop yourself? You need to move on. You need to go back. Or kind of like Kate, just stay involved in so many levels. <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. Yes. Not to get too far off the topic and, and that particular book. Um, you, I know, George, you have a book about addictions a little bit. And it, and does that play a role in well, the paranormal, the afterlife? Well, the book you're referencing is a book Dan and I co-authored, oh, gosh, uh, 15, 15 years ago or so. Uh, basically, Dan was uh, working with... Uh, a project, I forget what it was, and I was oh, trying I to do some quick research on the whole field of addictive disorders, just trying to get a layman's book to try to explain what it is and also a whole lot of what it ain't. And that book didn't exist. So we put our heads together and said, okay, well, let's write it. So we wrote it. And it was just kind of a, a very user-friendly uh, overview of what that field is is and what it is not because there's a lot of myths about what addiction is and what it is not um i recall one one woman many years ago who was working with some some young people or something and she was really intent on well, we're gonna we're gonna develop some positive addictions and, no 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 let's go define the word addiction <laughs> first <laughs> and what you want to do or well, wanna, we want to develop some wonderful habits we don't you can't have a positive addiction. The addiction itself is a negative description, a compulsion. You know, you right. have to do something you have no control over. So anyway, so we wrote the book, and uh, uh, it has absolutely no relationship to what we're researching now. It's just a necessary book to have on the market for somebody who just wants a, uh, an easy read to kind of get a, a grasp on w what it's all about. 
I, I mention it because, you know, one topic that we talk about sometimes is like attachments will come up and mm-hmm. there's a, a spirit release therapy, you know, a segment out there of people trying to help other people that have addictive or even mm-hmm. mental disorders and they think they're caused by attachments like the the Wicklands, you know, back in the spiritualist movement to people like uh, Terrence Palmer in more recent times. Mm-hmm. I've talked about these things where they may have some sort of spiritual attachment that's kind of driving them into the addiction or the addiction is a window to, to op- the connection to these maybe negative things in their life. That feed off. Yeah. So let, let's uh, yeah. steer back to yeah. uh, the pendulum. Um, apologies. Give me one moment here. Paranormal Pendulum uh, 3 with Lindsay. Where, uh, where do you see things going? You continue to work with Lindsay now, correct? Um, <clears throat> Lindsay may continue working with us. Uh, we're, we're in the process now of beginning the research for our Paranormal Pendulum Book 4. Um, okay. Which will be, well, it's starting off. No telling where it's going to go. But uh, Dan and I are, are both uh, big readers of history and, and particularly deep history, Graham Hancock type stuff. All right. Yes, yeah. most definitely. And so many, so many cultures, particularly indigenous cultures, mm-hmm. uh, invariably will have uh, legends and histories very often of the old ones interacting with the sky people. Yes. Who come down and they share ideas or whatever they whatever they're mutual commerce would be. Uh, but that is just so regular worldwide that there's got to be something to it. That's our medicine man at Poverty Point. Uh, he mentioned that uh, he was kind of an intermediary between the population that lived there and the sky people who came to visit on occasion. So we will, we're going to take the paranormal pendulum and see if we can learn more about the sky people. And yeah, George, is, George is back in the, the, uh, the heart of the mound building culture. <laughs> who have had contact with the sky people. I'm out here in Arizona in the heart of the cliff dwelling people, the Pueblo people who have contact with the sky people. So it's going to be interesting to see what he comes up with compared with what I come up with and how we put all that together. That is going to be amazing. I want that book. <laughs> that sounds great. I yes, do. the sky people. Yes. Uh, sometimes are, yeah, I, right. yeah, I think that's just. I think that's just what we're doing now. Is just a platform. I've got a gut feeling that we're going to launch into something mm-hmm. way out there from sure. that. But the research right now is is very intriguing. Excellent, and I think that medicine man's name was Jocko. Is that right? Jocko. I, gave, I, I mean, I gave him that name because that's a character in a book I'm writing, and it's, it just seemed to fit him, J-O-C-P-O, Jocko. In your bio, there was mention of Men in Black, and is, is that a, a cover-up type situation? Do you think the government wants us to have all this information, or was, or is it something? Uh, the references to Men in Black with respect to this book is just uh, Lindsay had a few experiences that might fall under that description, where uh, after... <clears throat> After the Netflix series aired, uh, she was in her office one day, and um, she works at an institution that has a private office. There's a, a private line that comes to her office. It's a direct line, but it's never used. Nobody knows that phone number. Even her husband doesn't know it. And people trying to contact her will go through, if you will, the front desk, and they'll be sent to Lindsay's extension on another phone. But Lindsay was in her office one day, and the direct line rang. Oh what's going on here so she picked it up hello and a very gruff male voice said where's tim that's her husband uh well tim's not here i need to speak to tim uh and just kind of you know a little verbal bullying and then the caller hung up abruptly and that was unusual and a couple weeks later her husband tim is actually in her office he brought lunch that day and the phone rings again and Lindsay answers, uh, hello, I need to speak to Tim. Uh, can I say who's calling? No. <laughs> like, uh, so I kind of get your attention. Yeah. Uh, yeah, most certainly. Yeah. And uh, there were times when there was a dark car just parked across from their house. Um, just, just parked there, <laughs> not doing anything. And Tim had an experience. Uh, at that time, he was working retail. And he was closing shop one night, and there was a black truck. Uh, out in the parking lot that was blocking his car, whereas he couldn't leave. 
And so Tim kind of stayed in the store and kind of got some of the other other staff to kind of what's are you seeing what I'm seeing? Yeah, what's what's going on here? And finally the car left and went off. Um, so there was a so things like that that sort of suggested third party interest, and we did a session on it. And basically, yeah, uh, there's third party interest, but it's not harmful. Excellent, excellent. It's, so the book is called Paranormal Pendulum Three. The Abduction of Lindsay Higgins, The UFO Phenomena, The Spirit World, and Beyond. Um, I noted that the book could be uh, found on Amazon. Is that your preferred place for people to go to, yeah. to find this? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Lindsay Higgins is examined, and you guys were part of this, in a Netflix series, Haunted. And, oh, season it was season one, one, episode five. Season one, episode five. Okay. Uh -huh. that uh, so you guys can go check that out. That's still on Netflix. Right. Right, and there, there's some other places where people can find you personally, www.danbaldwin.com, www.georgesewell.com, uh, and um, also www.fournightspress.com is another place. And it, are all the uh, Paranormal Pendulum series are they available on on Amazon? Yeah, yeah, all yeah, all my paranormal books are available wherever you buy your books. Okay. In ebook and, e oh. and paperback, some of them in hardback, but wherever you get your book, you can order my books. Great, great. Like, I, I love, uh, you know, support your local uh, booksellers if possible. If yes, you're please, out there, yes. You know, get out there and, and support mm -hmm. the small business and keep the bookstores alive. I miss them. They're so. Walden's books, you know, Barnes and Noble, fewer out there in the mall. And they used stuff. to be, you know, but. Um, it, yeah. You know, we still use Amazon too. We're not going to lie. No, uh, this has been fascinating. I, I've enjoyed this conversation immensely. We, I well, have. Too. Where would uh, you guys have any events coming up that you want to tell us about? Just more research. Just more research. Yeah. Working yeah. on the fourth book. We'll do the fourth book. That sounds well, We want to know more about Lindsay. Yes, please. And uh, we, we're going to look into this ourselves. And, and mm -hmm. um, I'd love to read that book. We'd love to, to pick read them up. all. Yeah, yes. we do. We, we, we get that's most of like our. our <laughs> we're not just hosts; we're customers. Yes, aren't it? customers. There's, there's a whole hosts. rack full of books over there. <laughs> huge from folks book. like you are, who are breaking ground and, and yep. discovering this phenomenon, trying to explain what might happen in the afterlife, which is a question I think we all want to know. This has been great. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank George you, George and Dan. Love it. Love it. Appreciate Thank it. You guys. All right, so stay on with us momentarily. We'll just wrap things up real quick. Now that's all the time we have, and uh, wow, that was that was great. That was, was wonderful talking to these, fascinating. these gentlemen. They uh, yes. have, have wonderful experiences to share with us. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Do check out their book again, Paranormal Pendulum Three, available on Amazon.com and hopefully at your local bookseller. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see you guys next week, and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.